What is up my YouTube family? Welcome back to my channel. If this is your first time here, then it's just welcome to my channel. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button because you will not be disappointed unless you just don't have good taste. And if that's the case, then check the dislikes. There's more of you out there. Y'all, it took everything in me to sit down and film this video. And let me tell you why. Now, before I say anything else, let me just say this. This is not about to be a spoiler, so don't get your little draws in a bunch. It's not going to be a spoiler. I have been watching Squid Game on Netflix. If you have not watched it, 10 out of 10 recommend. I watched episode 1 halfway through and then I turned it off because my attention span is short. So if in the first 20 minutes or so you can't grab me and reel me in, child, I'm not going to complete it. But Melissa was like, no, from the end of episode 1 through the rest of the season like it's just a great show so i went back and watched it and it really is so i recommend it it's on netflix if you have not watched it it's insane now for those of you who have watched it know what i'm talking about and those who go and watch it and wonder no i would not play the game honestly when i did the currency conversion the cash reward is not even all of that in usd like no it's a really good show. I really wanted to get into episode six, honestly, instead of filming. But I said, let me be responsible and go out here and film for my girls. Because if I don't, this video will not make it up Tuesday. See how much I love y'all? I be putting y'all before me and stuff. All right, let's get into today's story. Let's get in these people's business, shall we? So on December 30th, 1914, this nice little couple, they give birth to a son they named Ray Copeland in Oklahoma. And little Ray is a Capricorn. Throughout Ray's childhood, his family really struggled, especially when the Great Depression kicked in and just was doing a lot. They would move around a lot, his father often searching for work, and eventually they settle in the Ozark Mountains of Arkansas. Now, even though the Copelands were very poor and struggling financially always, Ray was a very spoiled child. Now they didn't have material things to spoil him with. So he wasn't in the new J's or nothing like that. He was more so spoiled in the way that he could get away with things that his siblings could not. They felt like he was favored among the children and that his parents just pretty much always took his side when it came down to it. Like Ray could do no wrong in their eyes. During the Great Depression, it was pretty common for young children to drop out of school or have to drop out of school to help their family bring in income. And so when Ray is just in the fourth grade, he drops out of school to help his father with the family farm. Now at this point, he cannot read or write. So he is what they refer to as functionally illiterate. He works alongside his father doing whatever he can to, you know, contribute to the family funds from his young childhood well into his young adulthood. But around the age 20, he started to feel like, you know what, work is honest, but it ain't quite paying the bills. Okay, I need to get some fast money some kind of way. Ray does this by stealing two cows from a farmer and then selling them in another town as if they were his to sell. Now, luckily for him, when he gets caught, his father is able to cover for him and avoid charges being pressed. Unfortunately, this situation does not deter Ray from wanting to steal cattle and sell it elsewhere. He just figured he needed to be a little smarter about his actions. He also adds forgery to his criminal resume. Now he does this for a while, but he gets caught again when he starts stealing everybody's government checks. At this time, checks from the government were being sent out to less fortunate families to help them throughout the Great Depression, like the OG stimulus checks. They probably really work on stimulus checks. Anyway, Ray would keep his eye on the neighborhood mailboxes and check them. And if there was a check from the government in there, he would then scribble a signature on the back of the check and take it down to the bank and cash it. He even stole his brother John's stimulus check job. Just ruthless. When he is caught doing this at the age of 22, again, it seemed that Ray could do no wrong in his parents' eyes. No matter what he did, they always had his back. They always made excuses for him. When he got caught doing this, he told them that he was being framed. It really was not him at all, child. They just were conspiring against him. Even after Ray is convicted for his crimes, he convinces his parents that this is all a mistake and that he will beat the system. And child, he does not. He is sentenced to a year down to the local jail, which he serves every day of. For the three years following his release from jail, there are no public records about what Lil Ray was up to during this time. I don't know if this was staying out of trouble or if he was still committing his little cow schemes and 
forged checks. He is a Capricorn, so you cannot be too sure. He could have just been getting away with everything for a little while. In 1940, at the age of 26, he meets 19-year-old Vay Wilson, the Leo, born August 4th, 1921 in Harrison, Arkansas. She grew up in a dirt floor cabin in a very religious little family with a whole bunch of siblings. It was seven of them in all, and her father was extremely strict. Now, she was able to attend school for a little bit longer than Ray. She would work for other families who had a little bit more money, babysitting, doing laundry, cleaning their houses. And she is doing all of this in addition to going to school until she reaches the eighth grade. And at that point, her family felt like it would probably be better if she dedicated more time to working and bringing in income to help out the family. And so at that point, she is forced to drop out of school, but she had at least learned to read and write by that point. Now, when Sis meets Smooth Talking Ray, she is very impressed by not only his charm and personality, but his ability to make a lot of money, allegedly, because this is just what he told her. He brags about having a lot of money and being able to make a lot of money. Ray said he got 99 problems, but money ain't one. And so Faye believes him. Now, according to Faye, she is almost instantly enamored by Ray. And it's not just the promise of stability. That was just the added bonus. She liked his personality as well. And he liked her too. The two of them get married just six months later. But it is not long after that that Lil Faye realizes that the game that he had spent was pretty much just smoking mirrors. He didn't have have anything he wasn't all that good at getting it either this man is not nearly as financially stable as he has led her to believe not even close within the first year of the marriage the two of them begin having children they have their first son and then a second son child sons everywhere and now with their rapidly growing family ray is really struggling financially to support them. He feels like it has a lot to do with the area they live in that just wasn't no money down in Arkansas. And so he decides to take his little family to California. I get to California and they have another kid. And Ray is like, you know what? It was cheaper in Arkansas. So let's just go back there. And for the next couple of years, they bounce back and forth between California and Arkansas. And they keep having kids, child, totaling five when they get through. After the arrival of their fifth child, Ray decides to permanently move his little family to Arkansas. Now he claims that the decision was made because it was just economically better that they raise all of these kids in Arkansas where things are cheaper. But quiet as it's kept, the rumor was he had been stealing livestock from his boss in California and he was this close to being caught. So before he got into trouble and faced more charges, he grabbed his little family and moved back to Arkansas. Now unfortunately, he brought his scam and ways back down to Arkansas, child. He just was not about earning an honest living. He found it to be really easy to steal livestock and then resell it. So that is what he goes back to doing. What makes it so easy is the fact that it is extremely difficult to prove ownership of a cow or a pig. At least it was during this time, the 40s. They didn't have no serial numbers, no social security numbers, none of the things. So it is very easy for him to resell them as his own. And these animals at the time were going for a really good price. One thing about Ray, he could concoct a little a little scheme but he wasn't that good at carrying it out for long before getting caught because a month after they moved back to Arkansas he is arrested and charged for stealing cattle the time that he spends behind bars his family is pretty much left destitute they had no savings to go off of and with five kids at home to take care of like Faye was struggling and it really wasn't realistic for Faye to be able to go to work during these times and take care of five kids by herself the family had nothing extra and was lacking most of their bare necessities so they were really struggling to survive out here and it got so bad that they eventually have to move in with Ray's brother John. Yes, John, he was still in the stimulus checks from that John. In 1915, Ray is finally released from jail. And at this point, he feels like, you know what? Something has to change. We can't keep living like this. So he uproots his little family and moves them to a small town in Southern Missouri. Unfortunately, he was not ready to give up the scam life. That's not the type of change that he was talking about. That's just, that's just too far. Now Faye, she goes out and she gets her a little bit of work too, doing what she knows to do. A little housekeeping here and there, a little laundry. And she is able to contribute to the household financially though it isn't much it's something and after a while the two of them together actually acquire enough money 
to purchase their own home, a very modest little farmhouse on about 40 acres of land. It wasn't much, but it was theirs. And they were very proud of it. He continues his pattern of stealing and reselling cattle. And he also continues his pattern of incarceration. That is until finally all of these years of going in and out of jail. It catches up to Ray and he's just like, you know what? I'm at my breaking point. Like I'm so tired of this. I am ready for a lifestyle change. Well, kind of. This one time he comes home determined to change things, but he had also changed himself quite a bit. Ray was never very violent toward the kids or his wife. He was pretty fair to say the least, but he comes home this one time with a new plan and a whole new attitude too. He was very nasty, very rude and condescending. He had changed a lot. He becomes prone to these extreme fits of rage and anger, most of which was taken out and directed toward his sons, more so than the girls or his wife. Although they were the targets of his rage sometimes, but they didn't get it nearly as bad as the sons. He became very self-absorbed and very isolated. He no longer wanted to participate in any of the birthdays, any of the holidays, nothing. He just wanted to be left alone and unbothered. And bothering him in the slightest way would set him off. Faye is noticing that her husband has changed in a major way for the worst child. And she not only notices the change, but she feels like he is actually enjoying this. Like he enjoys tormenting them. Let me just give you a couple of examples of this. In the wintertime, when it was a lot of snow on the ground, he would force his sons to go out and milk the cows. But he would forbid them from wearing their school shoes. The problem with that is they only had one pair of shoes. They were the only shoes that the kids had. And so they would have to go out barefoot in the snow and milk cows. The cows would be kicking at them child. It would just be a whole thing. And it would take a long time. They would be out there barefoot in the snow so long that when the cows would do a number two on the ground, they would stand in it and mush their feet around in it just for the warmth. And Ray thought this was, quote, funny as hell. There was one instance where his sons were out there helping him gather hay and his son Al actually breaks his wrist. He responds by telling Al that he is being a wuss and he is just being dramatic pretty much. But even when his wrist swells up like a balloon and he is obviously in a lot of pain, he does not allow his son Al to stop working. He doesn't even allow him to slow down or take a break. He demands that he keep going until the job is done. Al has to continue to work all day like this, gathering and moving hay, tending to the animals, until everything on the farm is done. And that evening, when he was still very much still in pain, Ray says, okay, now that the work is done, Faye, you can take him to the doctor. Just a horrible person. Once the doctor does confirm that the wrist is actually broken and that little Al was not being dramatic, Ray does not apologize. He does not acknowledge the fact that he was wrong none of it he just continues to go on about his his evening like nothing had happened unfortunately Faye coming from an extremely religious family she believes that the man is the head and not to be questioned and so she never does she never challenges her husband on any of the decisions that he makes not even in the defense of their children she just lets him rule the house how he wants to. And y'all, when he would go down to jail all these times, she would tell the kids that he was simply out of town on business. As soon as they are old enough and able, one by one, the Copeland children leave the house. Some of them never look back, never return, nothing. The daughters, as soon as they are old enough to marry, they marry not for love, but just to get out of the household and get away from their parents. One of their sons even joins the military after an altercation with his father. Ray got so upset with his son about some chores that he beat him with a hammer. And at that point, he was like, you know what? If I want to live, I have to get out of here because this is a lot. They, by any means necessary, were leaving the home. Now feeling like something has to change because he just cannot keep going back and forth to jail at his big old age. He and Faye have a conversation because they feel like the money was good. And so whatever they transitioned to, it needed to be something that was close enough to that amount of income. But at the same time, was not risking Ray's freedom. He begins doing odd jobs at other farms, but it is not nearly as much as he was making out here scamming people. And then... All of a sudden, Ray began spending a lot of time down to the cattle auctions. 
up each time with a disheveled looking partner who most assumed was just a hitchhiker that he had picked up and given a ride to you know the rest of the way the two of them would always arrive together and then they would split up and divide into the crowd watch the auction and each time that ray sees a cow or a pig that he wants, he would tip his hat. And then this man that he arrived with would place a bid. But Ray himself never bid on any of the animals. At the end of the auction, the man would then go collect his animals. It would be anywhere from a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars worth of livestock which he would pay for with the check and then he and Ray would leave together. Ray would then turn around and sell most of the livestock to other farmers. What is that buzzing sound? I know it probably sounds like a barber shop in my background right now, but I believe they're cutting the grass in the thunder. It's a lot going on. Now the plan that little old Ray had come up with that would bring in a nice little piece of income but would not at the same time continue to risk his freedom. He would recruit homeless men from shelters and missions in neighboring towns, not in his own town. He was traveling a little bit. He would go out and offer them $50 a week plus room and board to come work on his farm. Now a lot of them saw this as too good to be true and they would not agree to participate but some of them did take him up on his offer and felt like it was not a bad deal. Like, what is the harm? Now, little did they know, it was plenty harm actually involved. Once they got to the farm, he would then have them open up a checking account with their name and he would give them $200 to deposit into the account. The two of them would then go to these cattle auctions together where he would watch for Ray's signals to bid on these animals. At the end of the auction, the man will go collect his livestock and pay for it using a check from the account that he had opened with the $200, which will clear at first. Then they collect the cattle, Ray will go sell it. And each time he shows up at the auction with a different man doing the same thing. Meanwhile, the last check then bounced and they're looking for this guy, but they can't find him anywhere. Now, one of these men was a man by the name of Dennis Murphy. And in 1986, he is listed as one for writing bad checks down to the auction. While investigating, the detectives find out that the cattle that Mr. Dennis had purchased had been hauled away in a trailer that belonged to Ray Copeland. This, of course, leads them to go question the Copelands about Dennis's whereabouts. And when the detectives get there, the two of them already have a story. The story that they tell is that Dennis had wrote them bad checks too. They were allowing the man to live in their home and he was to pay them. And then one day he had just up and left after writing them a bad check and they just suspected that he had done so because he of course knew that his check would not go through. The elderly couple claimed that they had not seen him or heard from him since he left their farmhouse. And Dennis was known to be a drifter, so this did not sound too far-fetched for the investigators. They take the couple's story at face value and figure that at this point, this man could be anywhere. Like he's obviously on the run and committed to a life of crime. Shortly after this, a deputy from a whole different county comes to the Copelands looking for a man by the name of Wayne Warner. The Copelands give him the exact same story that they had offered him room and board in exchange for payment. And then all of a sudden the man disappears when they cash his check it bounces and they figure that he had just run off because he could not afford to pay them. Before you know it, there are seven men who are now wanted for writing these bad checks at the cattle auction throughout the central Missouri area, all of which have now gone missing and every last one of them having some kind of connection to the Copelands. Every single time the Copelands had an excuse and little to no information that was helpful to them in their investigation at all. Then in October of 1989, the investigators catch a break. They receive a call from a man by the name of Jack McCormick claiming to be an ex-employee of the Copelands and also claiming that if they go out there and dig around a little bit, they will surely find human remains on the property. Now, because they were already suspicious of the Copelands, they waste no time going around there poking around on the farm. Their search of the 
farm, it yields no bodies. There are no bones or bodies anywhere that they can find. But what they do find that they feel is of importance is a handwritten list of about 24 men who have been employed on the farm since 84. Now they had this sneaky little suspicion that this might be an actual list of their victims. They also find several articles of like clothing and different possessions that they suspect might be the property of some of these missing men. So they collect that too. And the most damning piece of evidence that they find is this quilt that Faye had hand stitched out of missing men's clothing. And they were able to realize and confirm that these were the clothing items of the missing men because she had also stitched their initials in the corner of each item of clothing with a small x right beside it now they of course assume that this means that uh he is no longer in the land of the living when she put the little x by his name with all of this they are certain that the copelands were up to no good and they are responsible for all of these missing men but the question remains where are the remains child where are they not even their trusted little cadaver dogs are able to help them locate any remains buried there on the farm or just you know in a closet or a wall anywhere at this point they get back in touch with jack because they got questions and they need answers where did you see these bones at sir are you sure like why did you call us with this when they bring him into the station for questioning he quickly recants his story about finding remains on the copeland farm but he does offer them insight into ray's little cattle scheme he tells them that he is extremely afraid of ray copeland and this is why ray had offered him the same proposition that he had offered many men before him the 50 dollars the room and board in exchange for helping him on the farm he also talks the man into pulling off the cattle scheme which he had no idea what was going on at the time he tells them that one night ray enters his room telling him to meet him at a neighboring farm because a raccoon had gotten into one of their barns and they were gonna go out there and shoot it now he and ray into the barn and jack feels like something is off like he felt like something was up but he goes along with it because at this point, what other choice does he have, right? He doesn't trust Ray, so he's going to keep his little eye on him. Ray gives him a stick and instructs him to poke around at the area where the raccoon is supposed to be. Jack steps forward to do so, but he says that when he turns around, Ray has his gun pointed at his head. Ray is very obviously about to shoot this man, but he fortunately is able to talk Ray down. He promises Ray that he will leave town ASAP, never tell anything about ever being there at the farm. He would never come back and he also promises Ray to give him his small little fortune that he had saved up, which wasn't much, but we know Ray is a greedy girl. The next day, the man actually delivers on his promise. He meets Ray at a bank where Ray takes the little bit of money that he's able to give him. Again, reassures Ray that he will never see him or hear from him again. Again, but he could tell by Ray's demeanor that Ray probably couldn't be trusted. He probably would not hold up his end of the agreement. And so he slides out of the bank while Ray is not looking job before everything is done. While he is trucking down the street trying to escape Ray, he spots a used car lot nearby he goes in and convinces one of the salesmen to let him test drive one of the cars baby the test drive was his whole getaway he hit the highway and once he reaches nebraska calls the police station and tells them about the bones that could be found on the copeland farm he was not convinced that ray was not gonna kill him after they left the bank still the police figure this must be the way that things went with all of the missing men they just were not as lucky as jack to get away they are sure that the copelands are up to a lot of mess but they cannot find any of the bodies anywhere they are unsure how they are going to bring the copelands down for this but they look up when they receive another tip this time from an anonymous source claiming that one of the farms that Ray worked at often now has this really foul odor almost as if something is there dead and rotting they immediately go out to their farm and in no time find a shallow grave consisting of three men all of which with a single shot to the head inside of a barn on that same property they find a fourth body then another one inside of a well on the same property the man inside the well they are able to identify right away as dennis because he's wearing a belt with his name on it 
The other four men, they have a little bit more difficulty identifying, but it is not impossible. Ultimately, they do identify all men located on the property. In child 1989, both Ray and Faye Copeland are charged with five counts of murder. Faye's trial is first. Now, some people, including one of Ray and Faye's sons and Faye's court-appointed psychologist, did not think she was guilty. Even though the list of names are in her handwriting, they believe that that was simply because Ray couldn't write and he told her to write it down. They felt like neither that list nor the quilt that she made proved that she had any knowledge of, you know, what had happened to these men. And the opinions were torn right down the middle child because some believe that she had all the knowledge of all of the things that her husband was up to and that she was very much an accomplice. Now they did extend her a little grace saying that she was a battered woman and that because of this she herself was a victim of Ray and she should not be punished as harshly as he was. Now the prosecution was actually willing to you know entertain this theory and they offered her a plea deal which she could take a less harsh sentence if she you know testified against Ray. But she declined it and turned it down, saying that she had no information to give them. Baby, I would have been in there like Tyler Perry writing a screenplay. I would have been looking at the list of names over there like, oh, you mean Doug, Doug, Doug. The homeless got Doug. Yeah, Ray killed him. I haven't seen him since. It's a shame what he did to, you know. Doug. And y'all once they asked me about some, some details and I really didn't know, that's when I just would have got emotional, girl. And just acted like, you know, the thoughts or the memories were just too much to revisit. I would have came up with something. Her defense was that Ray simply told her to write these names down. And she did not question her husband. She really didn't even think much of it. She took care of all of the reading and the writing. And so there was no need for her to really question this. When he came back and told her to put an X beside their names, she just did it. She didn't question him. As for the quilt, she claimed that she only knew them as clothes left behind and as a very thrifty country woman. And she found a way to repurpose them. Now, on a technicality, her psychologist statement that she suffered from batter woman syndrome, it is excluded from the trial. So no testimony, no evidence about the abuse that she suffered at the hands of Ray or how he controlled her was allowed to be used in her defense. Subsequently, she is convicted and found guilty of all five counts of murder using those two pieces of evidence alone and is sentenced to death. Now, Ray Cope Copeland's trial begins after hers. Child, he is 75 years old up there in Fort Lyon and entering a plea of not guilty. His defense just argued that he was senile and mentally unstable and so he should not pay for his crimes as the average person would. They were not trying to hear it for Ray. He was found to be mentally competent by a psychologist, found guilty just as his wife was and sentenced to death. And at 69 and 75 years old, they are the oldest couple to be sentenced to death in American history, at least at that point. In 1993, Ray dies in prison before they are able to execute him. He was 78 at the time. Six years later in 1999, Faye catches herself a little break. Her sentence is commuted down to life in prison. She suffers a stroke in 2002 and is afterward granted a compassion release from prison due to her failing health. They got to feeling bad for sis, but unfortunately for her, the very next year in 2003, she dies in a nursing home. She is 83 years old. Now, beside the five recovered victims, the Copelands are suspected to have at least seven more out there that were never discovered. If Faye really was involved and she knew any of the things, she took that little information straight to hell well. She did not ever come back and say, okay, hey, this is what I know. And so now I want to know what you think. Do you think that Faye had anything to do with anything? Do you think she knew and was afraid of her husband? I really honestly don't even know what I think or feel at this point. I don't know if she knew and she was just fearful of him and she just needed him financially so she didn't say anything or if she really just did not know it's not like any of the bodies were found on their property then I might have gave sister a little you know side eye like girl I know you saw that fresh grave but no it was at other properties so he could have been out here sneaking and doing all of the things in the dark I don't know I don't feel like anything that I read convinced me either way about Faye bars that is it for this video 
give this video a thumbs up on your way out girl share this video with a friend don't forget to subscribe if you have not to all of you all that are new here welcome as always i appreciate you so much for spending your time with me and i look forward to seeing you in the next one peace before i go let me tell y'all how bella embarrassed me yesterday embarrassed me in front of the neighbors girl like she just does not know how to respect grown people so i'm holding bella because you know she has not had her last round of shots yet so her little feet can't touch the ground quite yet walking blue my neighbor who is familiar with blue and i stops to speak to blue and y'all know how bella feels about people touching her blue okay she don't even allow me to touch him sometimes so the girl is petting blue and talking to him and bella opens up her little mouth and goes Ew! and the girl is like oh you're talking to me and i'm thinking to myself yeah she's saying get your hands off my man girl and she's like oh she's so cute she reaches down pets blue again bella barks even louder and harder and i tell her at that point i'm like it's because you keep touching blue she does me the same way she will swat my hand she will fake like she's gonna bite me like you know how they jump at you with their little mouths but they don't actually touch you she does me like that she barks at me she will tell me to get my hands off of blue like he's not mine and the girl just thinks it's so funny like each time she touches blue bella is like ah! child bella got to cussing this lady out and i was just like oh my goodness bella is just hilarious like why is she this way i don't know that's the bella and blue update for today i'm gone for real now bye I feel like you would pass gas right when I open my mouth. Y'all, why did I forget what all of these damn mountains are? The Smoky Mountains. I used to know what all the mountains was in the sixth grade. Child, don't ask me now. The Appalachians. The Copelands are very poor and struggling financially. I was going to say they keep having kids. They did that too, but that is not what I was supposed to be highlighting very poor and struggling financial always now he does this for a while but then again ugh. okay thunder also bread and cavity cavity what the hell does that mean what was i even trying to say she grews she grews grews up so i don't know what ray was doing child but we know what he wasn't doing reading it right a very a very fattest that's what i was about to say with all the thunder in the background, is this is this officially ASMR? Child, if you were asleep, you woke now after that. This eyeshadow is creasing so bad. Like, what the hell? Question remains, where are the remains, child? Where are they? Not me throwing out a double entendre. I'm so smart. Ray gives him a stick and instructs him to poke around it. And, ugh. Receive another, at another at what? Her defense is reasoning for her that, ugh. Now, Ray's draw raise charles what trial now raise trial such a hard thing to say why 